Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for Chattanooga Faith Work Culture's February Lunch and Learn. Whether you're watching on Facebook, YouTube Live, or LinkedIn, we're so honored that you would join us and engage with this content. My name is Jonathan Ingram. I'm the Executive Director of Chattanooga Faith Work Culture. We're a nonprofit that looks to engage Christians uh, with what it means to live out the gospel in their work, in their community, and in the city. Uh, we are trying to create as much content as we can to support you in that. And so this month in particular, in February, we've been focused on the upcoming mayor election here in Chattanooga. There are 15 candidates running for mayor right now, and we wanted to provide you all with some resources to help you thoughtfully engage this process. If you haven't already, we'd encourage you to check out our website uh, there where we have a blog series running where seven of the 15 candidates have answered some questions for us around their vision for the city, their leadership style, uh, and also how they see the church being a part of moving Chattanooga forward in the years to come. We'd encourage you to engage that content. We hope it can be a helpful resource for you. And we would encourage you to, to vote and to prayerfully consider the candidates uh, that, that are running for, for election right now. With that in mind, for our Lunch and Learn event for this month, we thought it'd be great to speak to someone who has firsthand experience uh, with being mayor here in Chattanooga. And so we are honored to have Bob Corker join us. Uh, to have this event, to make this event possible, we're so thankful for some sponsorships. Thank you so much to Admark and to EPB for helping make this happen and for putting this event on for us today. So I'm going to introduce uh, Senator Corker, and then uh, we will jump right into a conversation. But uh, Bob Corker is a successful business businessman, a former United States senator, and was previously named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine. Corker represented Tennessean the Tennesseans in the state of Tennessee from 2007 to 2018, where he served as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and became a national and global thought leader on fiscal, financial, and foreign policy issues. He was Tennessee's commissioner of finance and mayor of Chattanooga before being elected to the Senate. His, his background, though, is in business. Uh, at age 25, he started his own construction company that expanded uh, over time into 18 states, uh, and he and his wife, Elizabeth, uh, called Chattanooga home. So, Senator Corker, thank you so much for taking time uh, to be with us today and for joining us in on this call. Um, before we get started, I just want to let those that are watching know that at the end of our time, we will do a Q&A with those uh, that are on this, this uh, video call. So uh, in the comments section of, of LinkedIn or Facebook or YouTube, feel free to, to write comments. We'd love to engage with you on that um, at, at the end of our time. But Sen Senator Corker, um, thank you so much for being with us today. Jonathan, great to be with you. I appreciate yeah. it. Um, well, I want to start with just a kind of a, an easy, a simple question. Just how you know you you've lived in uh, in Chattanooga for a long time. This has been home for a while, but you've been all over the world. You've had responsibilities in, in different places. What is it about Chattanooga that keeps you rooted here? You and your family that you've made this home for for such a long time. You know, uh, Jonathan, we were transferred over here. My dad was with Dupont uh, when I was in the summer before the seventh grade, and you know, started going to school here, playing sports, went to City High School downtown, um, went away to UT, uh, worked for four years as a construction superintendent where I was out on job sites around the southeast building projects. And I came back here and went in business and uh, at 25 and and uh, it's just home. You know, I, I, uh, I love it here. I got involved civically at a young age. I knew I was going to be uh, likely financially successful. I started getting involved in the inner city and seeing problems there and started, you know, an organization called, Ch you know, I just, I just became involved and it's, it, it is interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll digress for one second. I went over to Nashville and lived there for a little while as commissioner of finance. And, uh, and I did the job for about a year and a half. I wasn't sure what I was going to do next, uh, in business. And so I stayed there for a little while uh, as I was trying to figure that out. But uh, you know what? I felt like I was sitting under a shade tree in Nashville that I had not planted. You know, everything was lovely. Everything was growing. And I just longed to be back in my hometown and to be a part of uh, with others uh, trying to make our community even a better place. So it was, you know, I, I, I feel ownership here, like all of our citizens do who've been involved and 
it's home. So, uh, you know, we've had opportunities to be plenty of other places, but this is where we choose to live and we love it here. That's awesome. You know, as I, I, one of the questions I asked the mayor candidates that answer our questions for our blog series was, what about, uh, as they were discerning to run for mayor, what about their vocational background, their history had prepared them to be mayor, or is preparing them to be mayor? I wanted to ask you the same thing. As you were looking at running for mayor of Chattanooga and beginning kind of that part of your, your vocational journey, what about, what experiences had you had? What were the things that made you really feel like this was the right time to do that? Well, actually, you know, I'd been commissioner of finance for our state and had just come back. I bought two companies here. One was called the Osborne Company, uh, owned a, a lot of office buildings out by Eastgate. And then the Stonefort Land Company, which Tommy Lupton had owned, had been around since 1886. So when I bought those companies and merged them with the other activities I had going on at the Corker Group, um, I came back to town and honestly, Jonathan, I... I wasn't thinking about running for mayor and never had thought about running for mayor in my life. And the previous mayor, John Kinsey and Claude Ramsey, who was county mayor at the time, just wore me out uh, telling me about, you know, how great it would be to be mayor and how, you know, what kind of effect you could have. And and uh, and so uh, honestly, I think I think it was a couple of things. Um, one was I, I had been involved in the community for a long time. I'm you know, had started a nonprofit called Chattanooga Neighbor and Enterprise, which had helped, which had helped about 10,000 families here have decent fit and affordable housing. And so I was ingrained in the community. I've been on, you know, a zillion boards here. So I had the civic involvement component. But I think, you know, uh, look, I was a builder and a developer. I built a company, I built projects. And I think being able to begin, uh, most of your audience probably has read the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by, by Stephen Covey. And one of the things that a developer has the ability to do, a builder has the ability to do, is to envision the end, right? Begin with the end in mind and then put first things first. And I think for a mayor, especially at that time when we really needed to have some dynamic change just for what it's worth. We had been stagnant for, for many, many years. John Kinsey had uh, you know, created a spark in the community and done some things down on the south side. So I think I think at the time, again, having a, a vision and having the ability to put things in place. I'll add one more thing. It was totally a civic job to me. I mean, there was nothing political about it. Nothing. I never, I mean, politics just was not an issue. And I think that um, it allowed me to have a bold vision and just, you know, go and never think about uh, any of the political repercussions, uh, never thought about them. So I think I think the independence, uh, the ability to, to create a vision and put the pieces in place and actually have a sense of what was needed here in the community, but also having a a relationship throughout the community with people that that I'd been involved involved with for many years civically. That's awesome. Yeah, no, there's a lot that goes into that. And I hear that people were saying that you needed to do this and it started making sense. But back to you're right. 2001 I, could. I mean, even the day I announced uh, on the weekend of Labor Day weekend before the March election and then I couldn't believe I, I had done it. And so for about for about. 45 days, I tried to find somebody else from the business community to run. And then I realized I was going to get beat if I didn't get going. So, you know, in October, I started raising money and doing the things you need to do to run. And let me just say, because I just said that, uh, it was the most rewarding four years of my public service career. Nothing compares. And I tell people all the time, nothing compares uh, to being the city, a mayor of a city, a mid-sized city where you touch people where they are, you see the impact that you're having. You can transform your city. You really can and put things in place that will, you know, be there for decades, actually, in some cases, a century, right? So, so it's a wonderful place to serve. And I'm glad we have so many people in our community interested in being mayor. That's awesome. You know, 2001 was a different time in Chattanooga, as, as you quickly mentioned there. You know, as you were as you were looking at uh, about to become mayor, starting to look, what were some of the pressing issues uh, and needs of, and challenges of the city at that time that that were kind of the forefront things that you were having to think about? Well, let me go back to to 
you know, as a young business person, building a company that was operating around the country, I, I, not too many years before that, Jonathan, I can remember walking down the sidewalk and you could hear people say, well, what do you expect in Chattanooga? I mean, the expectations of the community were, were, were really low. And we had had a, a visioning process in 1986, 1984, it ended in 86. We kicked off some changes. The aquarium was built in 92, the first aquarium. Um, and then John Kinsey had become mayor in, in 1997. Uh, he had gotten some great things going down on the south side, which we still are benefiting from today. So the community had gotten a little bit of a spark, but honestly, uh, and he did a great job, by the way, as mayor, uh, getting that going. Um, it, it, we needed, we needed significant, significant uh, activity. We needed to, to recruit business. Mm -hmm. uh, we weren't recruiting business, in, in my opinion, in the proper way. We, we had inner city schools where um, achievement was really low, and we ended up putting an incentive program in place where high-performing teachers went into low-performing schools. We had serious crime issues, and we lowered crime by 50, violent crime by 52% during that four years by really working with police and understanding the hot spots and dealing with that. We we knew we needed a digital vision for our community. We knew that technology was going to be a big thing. And so we started something called MetroNet in our mayor's office. And it was about connecting, you know, office buildings with high speed Internet. Very quickly, we realized we were way out over our skis. And so I went down to the power board and was able to convince the board to take it over. And that's what created uh, Gig City. I mean, and they've done an incredible job with that, not just the high speed internet, but telephone and cable. And, and uh, but it emanated out of the Metro net effort that we had underway. We needed to have a site to build up, to have a big plant locate. Uh, Claude Ramsey and I, uh, you know, built Enterprise South together. So we have a place. And by the way, those efforts had been going on through the years of acquiring the land and getting it cleaned up. But we actually built the site itself and the roads that went into it. Um, you know, it was interesting, Jonathan. Uh, so crime, inner city recruitment, I mean, really making sure the Chamber of Commerce was doing the things that they needed to do to recruit businesses and working closely with them. But after six months, I had, and you, you need to do that as mayor, you need to implement everything you plan to do within six months or you want accomplishment. So when six months, when six months had gone by, we had, we had everything going and off and running. And I had noticed during that six months, some other things, you know, we had talked about our city being connected to the waterfront. And I remember going down to the waterfront about a month after being elected and all we had was an aquarium down there and a parking lot with the litter blowing across that. I mean, we weren't connected to the riverfront because we had the riverfront parkway with the high speed state highway that was keeping us from being connected. And so that wasn't real. Um, and so, you know, within the first year I announced a uh, $120 million waterfront development. Um, then that was done through collaborative effort. We raised half the money privately through 81 one-on-one -on -one meetings that I had with others. And we, we passed a bond issue through the hotel motel tax and, and it was transformative. I mean, it really was. Um, people who had attended the public meeting for that, Jonathan, uh, 300 people came to our first meeting to begin to envision what we would do. And they realized that, wait a minute, if we come to these meetings, um, something's going to happen. And so um, we had a second meeting and it was about public art. It was about connecting to the Hunter Museum, public art, and doing the same thing down at the waterfront and also attracting artists to our community. And Jonathan, we had 500 people show up for that meeting and and we built that in to the waterfront. And then, you know, when I was about a year later, um, about, I think it was after the first year of my mayor's time, I took a hundred mile bike ride. I, I turned 50 years old and I just wanted to, I just wanted to, demonstrate to myself that I was still alive. So I rode up one side of Lookout all the way off the backside and back. And during that period of time, I saw people with kayaks on their cars, uh, canoes, 
Um, I saw people hang gliding. I saw you know, stop at a country store to get water and saw people getting ready to go cave and bouldering, caving, bouldering. Uh, I knew people trout fished in the area. Uh, people were running. They were biking. And so um, I go down to Quality Tire the next Saturday and I see a guy from Colorado in there and I, you know, he knew he talked different. I asked him why I was there. He said, well, I moved here because this is the best outdoor city in America and we can operate our business anywhere. So the following Monday on Jeff Stiles program, um, a, a, a talk radio program at the time, I announced we were going to be the boulder of the East. And so we had a public <laughs> and people threw tomatoes at me, really. So, so <laughs> We had a public meeting to create an outdoor initiative and to attract Ironmen and, you know, growing events and and for us to be the, the outdoor city in America. And 900 people, 900 people showed up for that event. And, you know, I think we could capitalize even more so today than we are. But I think that really helped change the culture of our community. You have the digital vision with one gigabit uh, to everybody within 600 square miles. So you got great connectivity really helping right now during the COVID time. You add that outdoor component and then you change the, the physical nature of our community. Um, you know, having a waterfront that is so accessible, attract then Volkswagen. While I was in the Senate, we brought Volkswagen to Enterprise South. So, you know, it was a fulfilling period of time and hopefully you know, it's had a positive impact on our community, but it was done by partnering with organizations. It was done by creating that collaborative atmosphere where the mayor is the conductor of a symphony. And the symphony is composed of neighborhood groups, composed of the chamber, of Convention and Visitors Bureau, of River City, of all these organizations, Benwood, Lindhurst, um, these organizations that matter so much to our community. Hmm. That's really good. Um, so, you, I mean, you talked a little bit about this. That the the, the the I like that last thing how you described it as like an or in this orchestra and the conductor of that, and that that is probably very different than any other of any of the other roles you've had as in public service. And that was kind of my next question was just, could you describe the difference or what it, the uniqueness of being a mayor and leading in that capacity compared to some of the other roles you have? You know, being in the U.S. Senate for that long and the, the different things you've done. You talked a little bit about that already, but uh, one, if you could just compare and contrast those experiences, that'd be really cool. Well, I, you know, uh, being a mayor, in, in my opinion, done right, uh, and everybody, you know, has a different opinion about what done right means, but being mayor of a city like Chattanooga, you're a, you're a civic leader, um, you're a, you're a business leader, you know, you're trying to recruit business and help people, you know, get going and, you know, create the dynamism that increases wages, you know, secularly, the most important thing we can do in the public sector is to ensure that heads and heads of households have the ability, uh, to make a, to make a good living, right. To earn a good wage, to provide for their families, to, to have a vision for their family. That was, that was upward thinking. Um, but then the third component, I know this sounds a little odd, but you're, you're a minister. I mean, um, uh, you just wouldn't believe <clears throat> what people go through. And, you know, I would guess that a lot of people on this call, like me are very, very fortunate people and feel like they're the most blessed humans in the world. I know I do. Um, but, you know, as a mayor, you really touch people where they are. And and uh, I, this sounds really goofy, but it's just true. There wasn't a week that went by that I didn't have some public event where we're dealing with people and I become emotionally overwhelmed. Um, just, you know, dealing with the things that we were dealing with. And so what a great place to be, to be at home in your own community, creating a vision for the community, moving it along, but, but, uh, but touching people in, in such a real way. So you contrast that. And by the way, um, just going, uh, if you have a, if you have a bold vision, Jonathan, people will follow you. 
if you have an incremental vision, doing piddly things that, you know, political things, people are sniping at you, right? Because there's, there's no real activity. There's no real momentum. And so if you have a bold vision, honestly, you just go. You know, you, there is no controversy, really. I, I had one one little period of controversy I'll mention later, but generally speaking, you just don't have it. In the Senate, uh, the issues were big, and I became chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. I, I became the lead Republican on foreign relations um, after six years, and I did death marches around the world. I mean, I, I, I would leave on Thursday night and go to Afghanistan or Pakistan or Iraq, and I'd be back on Monday Monday for votes. Uh, and I, I, I went to 79 countries. You spend, uh, you know, just like in business, you spend 80 percent of your time on problems uh, and 20. And so I was in the problematic countries most of the time. But uh, but it's different. I mean, you're you're a legislator um, as chairman of the committee. Certainly I had clout. Um, I don't mean that in the wrong way, but I did. Our staff was able to, to do all kinds of things from getting Haitian babies out during the earthquake to same thing in, in the Congo to, I mean, you name it, we were able to help people in a real way. Um, but it's a legislative job. And I, when people come in and talk to me, Jonathan, about, you know, what kind of public service, I mean, if you're a business person, um, being an executive is a great place to be. And by the way, I don't think just business people ought to be mayor. I think, you know, anybody who's been successful and has the ability to implement uh, can be a great mayor. But it's it's a totally different role. The, the Senate, the issues were huge. Some of them were about war. Um, you know, writing the authorization for the use of military force, which I did. Um, uh, dealing with poverty around the world, dealing with modern slavery around the world. Um, but you're dealing with 99 other senators and 435 House members and an administration. And it's it's much more difficult to make things happen. Uh, but it should be difficult because the issues are so big that you're dealing with. And once you deal with them, it creates all kind of repercussions. But it's it's a totally different role. I cherish that. It was the greatest privilege of my life to serve as a United States Senator on behalf of Tennessee and to represent Tennessee and in, in our country all around the world. But but being a mayor, I you know, it is the very best. It just is. Yeah, I I can hear it in your voice. There was a there's a sense of the the heaviness of the Senate role. And it sounds like to make decisions there required a lot more work. You, you had a vision said six months you were getting things done as as mayor in Chattanooga. What what were what were some of the things that you were most proud of in the Senate that and, and how long did those things take to, to implement? Well I I mean I was really kind of proud. I, I hate to use that word. I was satisfied, let me put it this way, by my role. You know, when I first got there, I I, I was elected in two 2006, I took office in January, January 3rd of 07. And within a year and a half, we had this major financial crisis that took place. And Jonathan, I had, you know, camped on the banking committee and I'd camped on the foreign relations committee. But, uh, you know, I got a call one night at 10 o'clock saying, hey, Corker, you know, would you show up tomorrow morning at nine o'clock with Ben Bernanke and Hank Paulson? We got three Republican senators, three Democratic senators, and we got to figure out, you know, and I, I was, you know, I appreciated the role I was able to play during the crisis. And I really shaped, without passing any legislation, I, I shaped the future of the auto industry in Detroit uh, because I got President Bush to agree with my terms. And then President Obama, believe it or not, mostly uh, did those things. Um, so I was, I was, that was a, you know, during crisis, when you serve during crisis, that's when you really, you know, you people, that's the best time to serve, right? When there's a crisis and you can, you don't want them to happen, but you like to be there to make uh, a difference when they do happen. Um, you know, I think the way I led the committee, uh, the, the foreign relations committee, I, I, I feel good about that. You know, we passed numbers of pieces of legislation that uh, I don't, I don't want to go into all of them, but I, I, I'm, you know, they're still in place today. They're affecting things around the world today. Um, we passed something right as I was leaving. 
um, to really counter China's efforts um, and investing in countries to create a vehicle that we could use also to appropriately benefit, especially impoverished countries, to, to counter what they were doing with the um, Belt and Road efforts they had underway. So, um, you know, I, I led on the issue of modern slavery and awareness, and we passed a piece of legislation and appropriations bill to deal with that. I wish it was more effective than it is. And that's one thing that I, I think had I been there still, it would be at a higher level of focus in our country than it is today. But look, um, you know, for a business guy, 12 years is a, is a, is, is a long enough time to serve in a legislative body. And I'm so thankful that you and others let me do it. Um, but I'm also thankful to be back home. Well, coming back home, I, I, you talked I, when I asked you about being married, there's a lot of things that you implemented. Uh, Todd Womack had said that to me, too. He couldn't believe the amount of things that you all got done in four years. Um, so a two part question for you on that is wh what about your time as mayor? What were what out of all the things that you got to do and implement and help bring to the, the city of Chattanooga? What are you most proud of? And the, the, the flip side of that question is looking back on that time, what, what is something you, you wish you had uh had spent a little bit more time of, you know, and foresight looking back on that. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to use the word proud. I use the word thankful. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that, that we set the foundation to bring Volkswagen here. And then as a Senator, I was the first person to call them and get them over to my humble Senate office, if you will, with Todd and, began meeting with them at my home in Chattanooga clandestinely. Uh, uh, I'd come down from Washington with others. Lamar would come sometimes. Governor Bradison, obviously very involved. So, I, I'm, I, you know, I look at the impact and probably the most moving thing. When I was in the Senate, I got a call from the Volkswagen boardroom the day they were making the decision. We had a Friday afternoon hearing, Friday morning hearing, which was odd. And, um, I knew it was them. I had the phone in there because I knew they were meeting and I stepped out and, and Jonathan, um, I was so overwhelmed that they were coming to Chattanooga and I knew what that meant to thousands of people here as it relates to having a great job with a great company. Um, I became emotionally overwhelmed and told them I had to call them back. They were sitting in the boardroom calling me to let me know they were coming and I couldn't talk to them. So obviously uh, that really began while I was mayor by building the site. Uh, that was certainly meaningful. Uh, you know, the, the opening of the waterfront and, you know, as I was leaving office and just seeing thousands of people celebrating and I see, you know, the head of the hooch event when I drive over the bridge and uh, from, I mean, I love what's happened to our community as it relates to the outdoors. Certainly the, the Giga City thing has made us internationally known and care deeply about that. The crime issue, one of the things as mayor and, you know, when you lower violent crime by 52 percent, um, you know, if, if you know, I, and I told the mayor coming in after me that, you know, please, please, please keep the culture right at the police department because if they're not supported somebody in our community is being hurt their lives are being altered unnecessarily and so you know i'm thankful for the things we were able to do there what we did in the inner city schools by giving teachers incentives to the high the high performing teachers I, gosh, that was so touching. And I still, I go out to the Department of Education some, that I've gone out to a couple of their Monday morning meetings. And so many of the leaders there were people that participated uh, in that effort. And and so, you know, it kind of came and went. It's not being focused on now, I know, but but gosh, I'm, I'm thankful for that. Um, I don't know. Um, the outdoor, I mentioned the outdoor initiative. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just... I like all of it. And, and uh, you know, I think the next mayor, I mean, I will say that um, it's been 20 years since I was elected. Um, and, and certainly we've had some good things happening in our community all along. But I would actually say that, you know, it's it's time to reload, you know, and 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 uh, and really, you know, have a vision for our community and, and move it along. And I know I'm wandering around. I'm not really answering the question that well. As far as the negative things, um, I don't, I don't, 
we we went as hard as we could go during that four years. You know, I was I was almost recalled from office hmm. over over uh, changing MLK and Macaulay. They were one way streets. And after all the things that were, you know, the waterfront and the outdoor initiative and Gig City and, you know, the Enterprise South and crime and all the th- the recruitment that we did during that time, that people were upset about that. And, uh, you know, we did it to slow traffic down so that we'd have more of a better community. Uh, what people were doing is speeding by on MLK, getting out of town and speeding in town on Macaulay. And, and, uh, you know, I was nervous about it. I didn't want anybody to be hurt, you know, turning it two way. I was, I mean, I worried more about that than anything I did, believe it or not. I kept, I called Jeff Fitzer every day. Now you're sure we can do this and no one's going to get hurt. But, you know, people were upset about it and uh, I almost got recalled, believe it or not. And uh, um, so I'm not, I'm glad we did it. I look at, you going by UTC today is just so much better. So, you know, pedestrian friendly. I'd like to see more development taking place on MLK, but a lot has occurred there. Um, but uh, that's not negative. I'm glad I did it. And uh, and yet uh, some citizens here in our community th- put me through a panic for a few weeks. <laughs> Well, thanks for doing it. <laughs> uh, well, let me just remind our audience that you can you can enter comments into the the section uh, wherever you're watching from, and we will be doing a Q and A here in a few minutes. But but Senator Corker, we we are Chattanooga Faith Work Culture. We are a faith based thing. We want to equip uh, Christian leaders to to thoughtfully think about the places that they're called to serve, whether it's in business, in the arts, and nonprofit work, or or in politics. Um, you're a person of faith. I'd love if you'd be willing to share how, how has your faith informed your leadership, whether it was as mayor and business? Um, how does that shape how you how you make decisions, how you do things, how, how you live your life? Yeah, I I, um, I mean, I I in my. You know, in my 20s, when I was about 28 or so. Uh, you know, most people who know my story, I think, know this, but maybe I was 29. I was sitting up at Cameron Hill, which is where Blue Cross is today. It's where I lived for the first five years of being in business. And uh, I, uh, I, I had been taking this, I'd gone through the Bible from A to Z, did, did this thing called Bethel series at First Centenary, where for two years you go through the Bible and then, and then, you know, you, you, you teach it after that, uh, to others and, uh, and, and a passage that always affected me is in the old Testament, Genesis 12 and paraphrasing, um, paraphrasing that is, you know, God said to the people of Israel, you're blessed to be a blessing. You are blessed as a people to be a blessing. And that's always had a huge, um, huge effect on me. And then in James, you know, work without faith, without works. Um, sorry. So, 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 you know, I, and I've always been sort of a too much this way. I know sort of producing, doing, building, affecting has been a big part of my life. But anyway, during that time, I remember sitting up at Cameron Hill one Sunday, looking out over the city, it was a gray day and I'm just feeling just feeling, I don't know, less than whole, not that great. Was I doing enough? And I, I read about this mission trip to Haiti that first centenary, which, which is where I was at the time, was taking, and they needed a, they needed a, somebody that knew something about construction to go. And obviously, I did. So I went. Uh, Jonathan, I would just say that 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 period of time, that mission trip, no doubt, that began my path towards public service, not by being the, you know, head of the Republican party or doing political things. It was a civic side of me, the, the face side of me that, that, uh, really began my whole entrance to, to, uh, public service. Uh, it, there was a read at Mitchell street, you know, where the new common house is being built over on, well, that used to be an old YMCA that was defunct. And I would gather there on Saturdays, with some uh, other white guys. Uh, they were from Lookout Mountain Presbyterian. I don't know how I got included, but 
But uh, anyway, we'd meet down there on Saturdays and just help people fix up their homes. It was mostly an African-American community, pretty dilap- very dilapidated housing. And, and so it was that, that faith walk, if you will, that led me to see problems in our community, led me to see that we had citizens living here that, that you know, were living in some cases in, in ways you wouldn't want your pets to live. And, and um, but it was that stirring of, of faith of, that set me out on the journey of wanting to help other people, to treat them as my, treat my neighbors as myself, um, that really, you know, put me on the path. And, uh, and um, you know, it's caused me to lead a life that, uh, that uh, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm the most blessed person around. Thank, thank you for sharing that part of your story um, and the ways that those impacted you and where you're at today. Well, I, I want to make sure I leave some time for some questions and we have some that are coming in. So I'm going to I'm going to start asking a couple of those if that's OK. Um, here's one from uh, Matt Busby, who I think, you know, and, and he was asking, uh, what do you see as the biggest challenge for the next mayor uh, as they as they enter this new role in a couple of weeks? Well, I, I, I think that there are three or four things that I think all of the leading candidates are talking about, which are dead on. But um, we really have to um, we, we, we've got to really focus on business recruitment. I mean, we've 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 not been as active there as we can. But as 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 we could have been, we've been doing a lot of good things. But but that's an area that that we really got to focus on. I mean, there again, we want our young people to stay here. Right. Uh, the biggest investment that we make uh, in, as a community is the investment in education of our young people. And, and um, you know, we want that talent to be able to stay here and flourish. And so we've got to have an environment where, where that is possible. Um, obviously, the, the public safety issues, the issues of crime, they, they, just, they just never go away. And you've got to be vigilant because you've got to want people to be here and to be out. Uh, obviously, as I mentioned, when somebody is assaulted or something happens, it affects their life forever. I mean, and it's unnecessary and and it can be prevented. Um, um, obviously, we've got infrastructure issues. Uh, I mean, uh, we really have infrastructure issues that have to be dealt with and they've got to be laid out uh, in long term planning. Um, but but then I would say and that's the blocking and tackling kinds of things. I could probably mention one more. Uh, but then I think, uh, the mayor and we've had some issues with COVID, obviously we've got to overcome and and move beyond, but I think the next mayor, once they get the blocking and tackling underway and they've got the the police chief they want and they've got, and, and, you know, I, I will say making, making it easier to do things here. I mean, um, I, probably some efforts down at the DRC to, to make it easier to, 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 you know, if you're at business or you're going to build something that easier, just make it easier for people to do business here. Um, the, the mayor doesn't deal with education directly, but um, education is an issue that a mayor can really affect. And I know, you know, without being too modest, I know we affect it in a big way. Um, so I'm going to mention two things then beyond that. One is the mayor needs to, they need to create a vision that people will follow. Those things I just mentioned are blocking and tackling, right? Got to create a vision that people will follow. And I'm not sure that maybe that happens, you know, after the election, but that needs to happen. And then the piece that to me is, is is very troubling, Jonathan. I would say again, most of the people on this call today, just because of the, just because I, I bet people on this call are mostly people who feel like they've they've got a great future in front of them, and if they'll apply themselves, we've got a big segment of our community that is is just left behind. Um, uh, we got kids going to school that literally might have slept in a car that night or might have slept in a home that that uh, has no electricity or no food in the refrigerator or 
or there was domestic violence in their home and the policemen were there from one o'clock till four o'clock in the morning. I mean, the, there's a whole segment of our community that, that has, we've got to figure out a way to bring them along. And it's not, a, it's not waving a wand, it's hard work. But I'm afraid that if we don't do that, Jonathan, um, our community is not over time, the weight of that, the weight of us not dealing with all of our citizens um, is going to really hold our community back. And I, I don't even, I've met with some people in my office about the issue. Um, I don't know what the answer is, but what I do know is there's a big part of our community that, that, uh, that, that, that is not, or they're not living the kinds of lives they're not living in the kinds of families. They're not living in the kinds of housing. They're not living in communities where they feel safe. And and we we've, we've got to figure out a way of dealing with that as a community. And that's beyond one mayor, but one mayor can get that going. Hmm. That's good. That's good. Uh, here's a here's a bigger question. Uh, some have thought you should have run for president. Did you ever seriously consider that? And if so, what were the factors that led you not to throw that hat into your hat into the ring there? Yeah. Well, thank you uh, for the person who asked. Um, so what happens when you're in the Senate and you, um, you know, you're chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee or you're, you know, play a significant role, um, then people start talking to you about running for president. And so, you know, whether you think about it or not on your own accord, other people cause you to think about it by, by bringing it up. Um, you know, I, uh, it is the place where you can make the most difference. Uh, I mean, the difference between being a United States Senator and, pre and president is you're talking about, you know, we're in different worlds uh, as it relates to affecting our country. Um, I, I, you know, I thought about it when people ask, it wasn't anything that, you know, I, I don't know. I just, uh, you know, look, I'm 68 Who knows what happens down the road, but, but I, it's just not something that, um, I just, I think you've got to wake up every morning with that just overwhelming desire to be president of the United States. I don't have that today. Um, I will say, though, there's a whole lot of people that have that that I wish didn't have it because they end up acting different. I mean, they do these things to stand out. Uh, you, you know, the you know, the folks I'm not going to mention names. They're all the folks that, you know, want to run for president. You know who they are and, you know, they do things not because they sometimes think it's best, but because it brings attention to them. So um, actually, I hope we don't elect any of those types of people. I hope we elect someone who, who, who views the being president, certainly not like I did, like civic leader, but views it uh, more as a duty and, and feeling like that they've got some unique abilities that uh, can, can affect our country. But um, I, I don't know, Jonathan, I'm wandering around telling you, Sure. I mean, when people bring it up, you know, people bring it up when I'd come back home and speak at events or they'd bring it up in the hallways, uh, walking to vote. Um, so it makes you think about it, but I never thought about it that seriously, or at least not yet. Um, here's a question. Uh, as citizens and business leaders, what tactical things can we do? And what are some specific examples in the person, uh, clarified and said regarding those that are underserved in our community. So citizens and business leaders, what can yeah. we do to help with uh, that? Don't, gosh, it's, you know, I, I gave a talk, Jonathan, at the Rotary Club, uh, maybe about six months after I'd been home. And, and uh, I've talked about this very issue actually there. And someone came up to me and, and said, uh, uh, Corker, I know what we need. We need a Marshall plan for the inner city. And, uh, and I, I said, well, uh, you know, well, let's talk about it. And so we did. We we met actually for four or five months with some others, uh, both black and white uh, participants. Um, and and you know, there 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 is not a Marshall Plan. A Marshall Plan speaks to you know almost hey we do this and it's dealt with. Okay, it'll be dealt with in three or four years. I I don't know the. I think it's I think each of us 
had to figure out our role. Um, and, and, and for me, for instance, and, and again, there's so much more work needs to be done, but for me at a young point in time in my life, it was to do what I could to make sure people have decent fit and affordable housing, right? Now that was uh, something. So the, the person who asked the question probably has some unique gift. Um, and, you know, I think it's all of us, first of all, being aware, you know, we can forget, uh, we can live in our nice neighborhoods and, and, you know, go to, our, go to our, our nice schools and, 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 and kind of forget. The first thing is to be aware and then, and then to try to figure out how uh, each of us might plug in to make a difference in that regard. But, uh, but I do think it brings, it needs a mayor. It, it's, let me put it this way, hugely beneficial uh, for a mayor to make sure the community is aware to try to, to try to bring about partnerships, whether it's housing, whether it's employment, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, and I know our school system, I mean, the, the, the difficulties they deal with, with these, with these young children coming to school where the only, in some cases, the only good meals that they get are there at school. And so when they have that lunch, it's, it's unbelievable in a city like Chattanooga, that may, that, that may be the last meal they have until they come to school the next morning to get a breakfast and then lunch. And that cycle repeats itself. So anyway, um, I, I, I don't have the answer. It's a, it's a societal problem that's been going on for years. Um, and it's, by the way, we, we, we used to look at this issue only as an issue that was quote in the inner city uh, but it's not. I mean, if you go down to United Way and you, you talk to them about where they're getting calls about, you know, domestic abuse inside the household or, you know, issues with food security and that kind of thing, it's, it's, it's throughout our community um, uh, and in different demographic places. Hmm. Interesting. Um, here's a question. Uh, that Mark Harrison has, are, are you going to remain or become involved in a leadership role in mentoring young folks that are inclined to get involved in politics? You know, I, I, I do. I, I, I mean, I, I, yes. I mean, I, I talked the other night to an honors program at UT and by zoom. Um, I, I have people who, you know, come by here a, a lot, you know, asking about uh, some of it, you know, some of it's business, you know, they want to create a business. Some of it is they're thinking about running for office. Uh, I'm thankful that, you know, the, the leading mayoral candidates all have come by to talk to me some about what they might do and how they might approach the, the job itself. So look, I want to be productive. I am, I want to be beneficial. I am trying to you know, do business also. I, you know, I, I woke up one day, Jonathan, and, 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 and by the way, I just love it. Okay. It's not that, I mean, I think people know I'm certainly been very fortunate in life financially, but there's something about building things that is still attractive to me. And I woke up one day and realized from the age of 41 to 66, I left the Senate when I was 66 years old and I ran for my first office in 1994. Uh, in the United States Senate against Bill Frist, by the way, uh, and we became great friends. He, he beat me. Uh, we had a tough race. But during that 25-year period, I realized I'd either been running or serving in public office I did, for 20 and a half of those years. I couldn't believe it. I thought my whole life had been, you know, I, I was a business guy who'd spent a little time in public arena. So I do want to do that, too. Um and, uh, and that the answer to the question is, yes, of course, I want to encourage people to run. And, and uh, one of the things that really worried me, I left after 12 years in the Senate. I told people I couldn't imagine serving more than two terms when I ran. But, but there were some young people from Texas or other places who called me and said, well, look, I, I was going to run for Congress, but you're leaving. Um, why are you doing it? And, and I said, well, I, I mean, that's what I told people I was going to do. It was a hard decision to leave when you're in that kind of position, but you know, um, no, you should run. And so I do, I want to encourage young people to serve in the public arena. 
Um, you know, you think you can make a difference in the private arena and you can. God, you affect people so much by the way you lead them in business or lead them at a church like you're in right now, Jonathan, or you affect them. But the public arena does give you an outsized way of affecting people and we need good people to do it. Uh, Senator Cork, I want to be respectful of your time. Do you have a little more time for a couple more questions? I do. Yes, sir. I've got okay. nine more minutes. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, how, how can the city foster and draw more tech companies to Chattanooga in the future? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, we are, we are at somewhat of a disadvantage. Um, I read this book, uh, gosh, I wish, I wish I could remember the name of it, but it's called the thickness. It was about the thickness of jobs in a community. And so, you know, you have a, a place like San Francisco or, you know, places on the West coast where tech people go. And even though they're, a, they're you know, they can go there and they know that if they lose their tech job, there's another company right there to snap them up. And so there's a thickness of tech jobs and it attracts people. Um, now we've had this situation though, uh, this, this, this COVID situation since last March, which has displaced people. Um, I think one of the things, you know, and the mayor of Miami is doing this. Um, he's personally doing it. And by gosh, you know, if I were mayor right now, I'd be doing the same thing, but I'd be, I would be out there attracting. I mean, think about our outdoors. Think about, the gigabit piece. Think about what a wonderful place this is to live. Think about how easy it is to get around. I would be trying to attract individuals, individuals that work for other tech companies that can locate uh, anywhere in the country to bring them here so that we can begin developing that thickness of talent here in our community. And, and the, the more thickness of talent you have in the community, the greater ability you have to attract a tech company. I've, I've met with some of the companies. People still are nice enough to call me when there's a recruitment effort and maybe they think I can have some effect on it. And I, I know one of the issues they've had, Jonathan, is they come here and they wonder whether there's enough talent to support what they're doing. And there have been some discussions about programs between Blue Cross and UTC to train tech folks. But I think one place today we could get a real uh, we could get a real jump start going is attracting the talent to live here, to live here because they can work a farm. My daughter works for a company in New York. She's here in Chattanooga now and and um, do it on a personal basis and build up the talent pool here while simultaneously doing everything we can to lay out the carpet for those kinds of jobs because they are, they are the, they are the high paying jobs of today. And by the way, we don't need land for that. Hmm. I mean, we've got, I look out my window here in the volunteer building, look around and there is space everywhere in this community, uh, cool buildings and other parts that, that we can, we can put people. So it's not, it's not like Volkswagen where we had to have so many acres of flat land with rail and utilities. Um, we can put them anywhere and what a great place for them to be. That's a great answer. Last question I'll, I'll give you is from um, uh, Jim Gilliland and, and he asked, and how do you want people to talk about your legacy of public service? I don't know. I, I thank you for asking. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I've thus far, I've, you know, I've done the best that I could, the best that I knew how, not the best that I could. I've done the best that I knew how. Um, you can think back about moments. Um, I, I hope that um, uh, I, I hope <clears throat> I don't want to talk about it. I hope I've demonstrated a true love of my neighbors. Um, and I hope that um, uh, I hope the ability to create a vision and bring people to, together around it. Um, and uh, and I don't know. I, I, I can't answer the question. Someday I hope to, to be at this again for a long, long, I hope to be at it for 20 more years at least, uh, working hard and doing that. And someday 
I'll sit down and think about how to, how to answer that question. But let me say this, what a privilege it is to have been mayor of this city, serve in the United States Senate, be commissioner of finance uh, for our state at a time when we had tremendous financial issues. What a privilege that has been. And to your audience here, uh, maybe there's five people on, I don't know how many people are listening, but thank you to all of you for allowing me uh, to live the life I have. Well, Senator Corker, thank you for your service. Uh, thank, and thank you for taking time to talk to us. Um, I, I, I just am really blown away by one, how your faith, even without explicitly talking about is informing this idea of loving neighbor. I can just hear that in the way you talked about each of your roles. So I I appreciate you for modeling that for us. And uh, I know you're excited and prayerful for what Chattanooga's future is going to look like in the mayor race that that, that we're in and and what's coming up. So thank you so much for making time. I know in your busy schedule to to spend this hour with us and all the wisdom that you shared. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you all for for tuning in and for your great questions and for engaging our content. We are so thankful that you made time to be with us today. Um, Just want to remind you that we have a blog series on our website where we have talked to seven of the 15 mayor candidates who have answered questions. And and we would encourage you to engage this process. We'd encourage you to vote uh, and we'd encourage Christians to faithfully be a part of what's going on in our city. Uh, You heard Senator Corker talk about the ways his faith has informed what it means to engage the places he's been called to. And we'd encourage you to start imagining what that means in light of your context, whether it's business or tech, as was mentioned on the call, whatever it is. So we encourage you to check out those blogs. I hope it can be helpful for you as you prayerfully consider who to vote for. We'd invite you to continue to engage with our content. We'll be putting out information uh, regularly about different topics that are relevant to us here in Chattanooga. You can sign up for our newsletter on our website as well, and we'd encourage you to do that to keep up with that. And we do continue to post articles and other resources that we have um, on, on our social media channels. So thank you so much for making time to be with us today. We are honored that you would. Blessings to you in the week that you have ahead.